Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce today's uh, speaker, uh, Andrew Hendry, who's here as a Miller uh, uh, professor on sabbatical uh, from McGill, uh, and he's here for the whole year, I guess. Uh, hosted jointly by uh, Bree Rosenblum and Stephanie Carlson. Where's Stephanie? Back there. Uh, and uh, so he's, he's here for a year. He's been coming to MVZ lunches. I encourage you to interact with him. Uh, he's uh, been on the faculty at McGill since 2002. Uh, he got his PhD in, uh, from the University of Washington uh, and did a postdoc at the University of British Columbia after, after that. Uh, he has a long-standing interest in uh, both ecology and evolution, and in particular the ways in which ecological processes influence evolution, and evolutionary processes uh, affect ecological interactions. And I just learned he has a book that is uh, coming out that was just accepted, entitled Eco-Evolutionary Dynamics. Eco-Evolutionary Dynamics. So uh, yeah, be sure to, to look at that. Uh, he's published on a wide range of organisms, including uh, sticklebacks, guppies, sharks, and probably quite a few other things. Yeah. Darwin's finches, uh, that, uh, and probably other things that I'm uh, forgetting. And he's, he's published many, many papers. So if you want to be humbled, go look at his uh, website. Uh, if you do look at his website, and this is especially for the graduate students, I noticed he has a wonderful blog giving advice on uh, on all kinds of things in science, how to succeed in graduate school, how to uh, deal with the review process, and, and uh, if you read through this, you'll also discover that he has a wonderful sense of humor. And I'm not going to uh, read all of the things that are on there, but uh, among the things that are on there are examples of letters of recommendation, one that was written by his mother. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, she says right at the outset, before I say anything else, I would like to note that Andrew is intelligent, hardworking, organized, and handsome. <laughs> I have known Andrew since his birth. I can honestly say <laughs> without any bias that he has always been a good boy. <laughs> It, it, it goes on and on, and it's really funny. Uh, yeah. Rather than embarrassing him further, I'll let you go to his website and discover it for, you, so, uh, for yourself. So with that, welcome. Thanks for coming. And today he's going to be speaking on the nature of natural selection. Thank you. Um, what happened was that uh, a fellow student, uh, a friend of mine who was a postdoc at the time, Michael Kinnison, and I were applying for all these jobs, and we got kind of thought these, letter, uh, these letters of you know, application were just kind of silly. So my friend Mike, he wrote this joke one. And in it it said, and you will see letters of recommendation from Dr. Letter 1, Dr. Letter 2, and my mother, who will attest that I'm the smartest person she knows. And so I said this to my mom as a joke, and lo and behold, about a week later, she sent me a letter of recommendation and used a future job application. <laughs> so, um, what I'd like to do is talk about, um, oh, I forgot to say that I got an email a little bit uh, about a couple years later, because I posted it on the website, and I got an email a little bit later from a professor I didn't know from a university somewhere in the Midwest that said, um, you might find it interesting to note that someone plagiarized your, your <laughs> letter of recommendation. And sure enough, it actually, because it's like letter of recommendation template, right? And so they actually plagiarized the thing. It was pretty funny. <laughs> um, so what I want to do is talk about natural selection. And this is a relatively new talk for me because I've done a lot of work looking at, uh, as uh, was described, interactions between ecology and evolution. And in the course of all those studies, I've measured natural selection using standard techniques in a whole bunch of different study systems with a whole bunch of collaborators. And as time has gone on, it's become interesting for me to sort of revisit some of the cherished assumptions that we have about natural selection, as well as some of the frequent assertions that people make about it. Because the insights that we're getting from the work we're doing are sometimes a bit different, and they lead us in new directions. So essentially what I want to do is I want to take a step back, compile a bunch of theoretical work, empirical work, meta-analyses, and just see what we can say about general insights into evolution that we think we might already have into natural selection. 
Now, the basis for all of this really comes from Landy and Arnold's paper in 1983, which was a formalized way of quanti quantifying the strength of selection on phenotypic traits. And it just is the basic idea, if you have some relationship between a trait, doesn't matter what it is, let's just say body size, and you have some fitness measure, let's just say number of offspring. Now, of course, you can generalize that to any sort of trait where you have the relative trait value scaled to, scaled to a mean of zero, a standard deviation of one usually, and you have some measure of relative fitness standardized to a mean of one. And then you just put a regression relationship through that, and the slope of that relationship is selection. And then that slope plugs directly into the equations for quantitative genetic evolutionary change. I better start my timer here. It conveniently starting my timer after I've already had five minutes. <laughs> um, so you have a whole bunch of these measurements of natural selection. They, they plug really directly into equations for evolutionary change. And so everything I want to talk about is based on studies that essentially are using this approach. So that's directional selection. It's pushing you in one direction. Larger traits happen to be favored in this case. And so that's this case here where you have some initial phenotypic distribution. You impose some selection function on that. In this case, it's the probability of surviving. And you have some shift by the end of selection. So in this case, you have a slight shift in the mean uh, toward a larger body size. There are other forms of selection as well that can be quantified using the same methodology with slight tweaks. Here's one of them, and that is stabilizing selection. So I'm going to re return to these. So you have the same phenotypic distribution, but now the intermediate traits have the highest fitness, and fitness declines to either side. As a result, you expect the phenotypic distribution to contract due to this selection. The flip side would be disruptive selection, where you have, in this case, again, same phenotypic distribution, but now the, the most common body size or trait size is the one that has the lowest fitness for reasons that I'll revisit. And in that case, you basically cause the distribution to decrease in its center, thereby inflating the variance in the population. So the Landy-Arnold method has now given us many, many, many estimates of each of these types of parameters to the point where we can start asking these outstanding or controversial questions, some of which aren't really assumed to be controversial. For instance, we might just start by asking how strong is selection? Is it strong? Is it weak? How important is it out there? If we go out and measure it in some population, are we going to find that selection is really strongly pushing in some way, or are we not going to find anything? Another question is how temporally variable is selection? We go to a population and measure a certain trait in one year and measure selection on it. We go to the same population, the same place in the next year and measure selection again. Is it the same? Or does it flip-flop from year to year as environments change, for example? This is a fun one. Is selection stronger on body size than on other traits? So this is a very frequent assumption. As a matter of fact, body size or growth rate are often used as proxies for fitness with the idea that bigger is generally better. You produce more eggs, you can survive better, you have better mating success, etc. But we can take a look at that question and see, is that actually true that selection is stronger on body size than on other traits? Also, uh, in a changing world, it's generally assumed that environmental change will increase the intensity of selection acting on populations. <coughs> Presumably they're well adapted for the current environments, reasonably well adapted, so if we change those environments, selection should go up because they're no longer well adapted. And for the same reason, gene flow might increase selection. If you have a well-adapted population, but it starts getting genes from a population that's adapted to another environment, will presumably drag it off its fitness peak, in which case you will no longer have a well-adapted population, and selection will be pushing it back toward its optimum. So I want to just ask about each of these particular questions, take a look at what's already said about them, and then look at my own empirical work that addresses, that's relevant to it, and then often refer to meta-analyses to ask if these are, what are the general points with respect to these. So first, how strong is selection? Now, this is a, a, a classic question, and I sort of did a, a little mini review of it a little while back, where you can just sort of represent the, the back and forth of the opinions on this by reference to the authorities in the field. Starting, of course, with Darwin. 
where uh, this is a classic quote, we see nothing of these slow changes in progress until the hand of time has marked the long lapse of ages. So Darwin repeatedly asserted that natural selection, even though it was acting everywhere all the time, it was generally very weak, and it would be hard to see actually occurring in real time. And that was the received wisdom for a very long time, for give or take, a, with the exception of a few things like uh, um, uh, industrial melanism, adaptation to mine tailings, those were supposedly exceptions. Generally, selection worked really slowly. Then John Endler, in his classic book, Natural Selection in the Wild, actually started reviewing estimates of selection. This is pre-Landy Arnold. And he concluded that strong selection is not rare and may even be common. So you have a complete flip in opinion about how strong selection is. Now, subsequent to Landy and Arnold, people have collected from the literature large numbers of selection estimates. And the distributions always look like this. There's a lot of selection estimates that are toward the low side, and then there are uh, relatively few that go out to the end. Now, using this exact same distribution, you get varying opinions. King Solver, for instance, in the one that generated that, uh, that analysis there, which is where all this started, said directional selection on most traits and most systems is quite weak. Now, using this same data with a different standardization, Joe Hereford, uh, Thomas Hansen, and David Houle concluded you have extremely strong selection overall. <laughs> Same data. So <coughs> this suggests to me that really it's hard to figure out whether something is strong or weak, just like it's hard to say whether something is fast or slow. Is evolution fast or slow, right? It's all relative. So what we really need is some standard of comparison, one that makes sense, one that we can all agree on, that will give us a sort of a confidence in stating whether or not something is uh, strong or weak. And I suggest it might be how much variation in fitness is explained by the trait. So in R squared, we have R squared estimates from all of the work we do. It's just the strength of the predictive value of, of uh, the trait on fitness, right? So if those numbers are big, if they're one, then clearly there's a hugely strong selection because it explains all the variance in fitness on this one trait. Or maybe it's zero, in which case there's nothing going on. So I calculated this in, in this book. I'm so excited. That was, that was yesterday. <laughs> Seven years in the making, let me tell you. Wow. It's painful. Okay, so we have the same sort of thing, number of estimates, various in fit, variance in fitness explained by the trait, and the distribution looks basically like before, right? That's not the, the real question. The question is, what are these numbers here? All right, is this, is this you know, 1 over here, or is this point 0.1, or is it 0 0.01? What do you think, right? Uh, I don't know. I mean, really. I mean, we can guess, but I don't, I don't think we have any clear insight, insight into what this might be. Well, it turns out that this is point 0.1 over here, where the vast majority of estimates are below about 3% of the variance in fitness being explained by a given trait. Okay? So I think that by this standard, when we ask the question, how strong is selection, I think it's pretty safe to say most of the time it's very weak compared to the sorts of effects of interest to us normally. You know, if we found an R squared of 0.02 in whatever, whatever you're studying, if you found an R squared of 0 0.02, you would say there was no effect. Now, the reason why this probably is, is because phenotypes are presumably reasonably well centered under the fitness peaks to the point that almost all the individuals in a population set, sit on the relatively flat part of the fitness surface. So adaptation from the past has suited the population well for its environment, removed all of the maladaptive variation, and now selection is generally weak because you've gotten rid of the maladaptive variation. <coughs> So we set out to test this using uh, some simulation models where we had a, a relationship like that where you have a fitness peak and then we started with a really broad distribution of phenotypes and genotypes. And then each generation we let the population evolve and then we did a sampling like we would empirically to estimate selection and calculate selection using standard methods. So here's just a, a run of the simulation here. You've got a bunch of individuals running around in, the, in space. They've got traits. They've got genotypes. They start off with a really broad distribution. Here's the distribution of traits. Here's the fitness function that's acting on it. Nice stabilizing fitness function. You 
let the population go, and watch right here, right? So this is the original distribution of phenotypes. If you run it, very quickly they adapt to that peak, right? So almost all of the individuals are centered right in the middle of this, right on the flat surface at the top of the peak. Meaning that when you go and estimate it, you don't find selection very much. Now in addition, there's a lot of work, and so Michael Dobley's talk in um, uh, IB tomorrow, I, I have to go give a talk in Davis, so I can't see it, but you should go see it, because um, among other things, he talks about the role of competition in shaping environments. Now, if everybody's competing for some resource at which the peak is here, then presumably there's going to be lower fitness because of competition. So we added competition to another version of the model and did exactly the same thing. So now you have competition turned on, but you're basically starting off with the same situation. And now you can track the distribution of phenotypes and what happens <coughs> to the fitness function. So now you see this expected dip in the middle of the fitness function. It's a result of the fact that there's a lot of individuals competing for the resource that's occurring right there. And you get a broader distribution of phenotypes. But you see there's no clear evidence that there'd be any directional selection acting on this population. So if you run these and you calculate selection every single time, you get a distribution of the directional selection coefficients in the case where competition is turned off and the case where the competition is turned on. So this is what the distribution looks like. So in the distribution I showed you before of, of, of estimates from King Solver, et cetera, they're absolute values. So basically everything was made positive. Now I'm going to show you a distribution that shows both positive and negative values where the expectation is that everything is centered around zero. And this is what the distribution looks like. These are the significant estimates. These are significant estimates with large sample sizes. And of course, this point goes four times higher right here. So what you can see is that in a population that has adapted to its environment, if you go and measure selection on it in this relatively stable environment, you're not going to find selection. It's not going to be strong because it's well adapted. The same thing true even more so when you look in the competition case. Basically, you will not find selection acting in a well-adapted population. But the argument for this has always been, against this has always been, okay, that's fine. So what, you won't find directional selection, but you should find um, stabilizing selection acting on the population. These guys should do poorly, and these guys should do poorly. <coughs> fitness function like that. So if you go and sample the population, you should get stabilizing selection. But we argued that because of these two roles of competition and adaptation to this relatively flat part of the fitness surface. Even if you go and measure stabilizing selection, there are going to be so few individuals that fall far out on the edge of the fitness function that you won't pick up stabilizing selection either. And so we also estimated stabilizing and disruptive selection, where values that are negative will be stabilizing selection, values that are positive would be disruptive selection. And if you look in the case of um, no competition, you see that the vast majority of estimates you don't pick up stabilizing selection. Occasionally you do with very large sample sizes. So in most cases, if you have a well-adapted population, not only will you not pick up directional selection, but you won't pick up stabilizing selection either. And if you have competition involved, you'll almost never pick up stabilizing selection. Instead, sometimes you'll pick up disruptive selection. And indeed, that's what the empirical data seem to suggest. So, I said this already, most of the time selection is very weak, and I think that's generally because selection erases its traces. Once population becomes well adapted to a particular selective environment, then you won't see strong selection anymore. Of course, we'll re revisit this uh, when we talk about environmental change. <laughs> okay, next question, how temporally variable is selection? Now, this is interesting because there's a debate about this in the literature right now, of which Stephanie is a part. So uh, Stephanie and collaborators wrote a paper about temporal dynamics of phenotypic selection in the wild, where they looked at these selection estimates and how they varied through time within populations. And they argued that there was a ton of temporal variation going along. Then you had some other folks who came along and applied um, some Bayesian analyses that included uncertainty, and they basically couldn't detect any significant temporal selection. And so they concluded the exact opposite that Stephanie and colleagues co uh, concluded. So here again, you have a situation where you have exactly the same data with two opposite conclusions. 
Now, in this case, we thought that we could maybe address this debate by using an orthogonal approach. By looking at trait means through time, rather than selection itself. Because as I've just shown you, estimates of selection don't necessarily give you a good indication of what the fitness landscape really looks like. <coughs> the fitness landscape under which it has evolved. So instead, if we really want to figure out what are the consequences of temporal variation, we might be looking at how variable are the mean values of traits through time. And, once again, with this idea of needing a standard of comparison to say whether something is lots of variability or not, we can compare it to something else, such as spatial variation. So we can ask about how much do the mean values of traits vary through time in relation to differences between populations in those same traits. So the first place that we looked at this was in Trinidadian guppies where you have adaptation to a whole bunch of different uh, predation environments and other environments in Trinidad. The predation contrast is the one that people normally focus on, <coughs> where you have these rivers that flow to the north in Trinidad and rivers that flow to the south. As they flow to, uh, out of the mountains, they go over these waterfalls. You get a lot of predators below some of these waterfalls, but no predators above those waterfalls. So for many years, we've been sampling from, a, these are two different watersheds in the north part of Trinidad. And all these arrows are indicating places that we have samples. This was from a number of years ago. From these, we selected a number of sites, a couple of which were high predation sites and a couple of which were low predation sites in two different watersheds. And we said, let's just monitor these sites over long periods of time. Guppy color is this classic example of adaptation to predators selecting against high color, but females favoring high color. So that should differ between high and low predation sites. How stable are these patterns through time? So we did very careful photographic measurements and we quantified the amount of any kind of color you can imagine on these fish. And in this case, we're gonna look at six sites over a six year period. And the question is how stable are the differences between sites? So here's what the data looked like. There's a slight increase in the amount of orange color here because we got better and better photographic methods. But in general, these three sites always have higher orange color than these three sites. So although there's a little bit of temporal variation, the spatial differences are always maintained from year to year. So this suggests that within this system at least, there may be a little bit of temporal variation in selection, but it's really having no consequence for adaptive divergence among populations. We also went into all of these populations and physically measured viability selection acting on color. And so we have a whole bunch of estimates. These are different colors along here. These are all the different estimates from different sites in different predation regimes. So this is the amount of selection acting on each of those colors, positive above the line, negative below the line. So first point of interest, viability selection does generally act against colorful males because it's being counterbalanced by female selection for colorful males. Interestingly, however, there was no clear difference between high and low predation sites. We might have expected that in high predation sites you would see stronger selection against color, but we're not seeing that. Possibly because, once again, selection is erasing its traces. They're well adapted to these environments. But possibly also because the variation among sites is driven in large part by sexual selection. So natural selection will always be in this interaction with sexual selection. Sometimes it will be strong, sometimes it will be weak. Here we think that the spatial variation in guppy color is driven mainly by sexual selection, which may have evolved to line up with natural selection. Another place in which we looked at spatial variation, temporal variation in relation to spatial variation was in Darwin's finches. So Peter and Rosemary gave a couple talks uh, a little while ago, and so you saw them. So uh, presumably many of you saw them. So the background is essentially the same. You've got the Galapagos Islands, you've got a bunch of finches running around on these islands. The finches differ in beak size, and that beak size varies through time. That's one of the main lessons of the Darwin's finch system, right? Rapid evolution of beaks. So all of that work, well, <coughs> sorry, not all of it, but the stuff that Peter and Rosemary focused on was on Daphne Major, right here. We've been working in two other sites on an island uh, just beside Daphne Major, over the same period, the same last 12 years. And so we were curious, well, to what extent is the temporal variation you see at Daphne Major also seen at these two sites? 
And how does that relate to the differences between the sites? So in essence, how, how important is this temporal variation in messing up potentially the spatial signal? So here are four ground finch species, cactus finch, small ground finch, medium ground finch, large ground finch. And if you look at the three, by the way, this is in collaboration with Peter and Rosemary who provided all the data for Daphne Major. And here is uh, PC plots of beak size on this axis and beak shape on this axis. And the different species are color coded accordingly. <coughs> Now, what I want you to draw from this is that there's big differences among the sites on average. So, for example, at Daphne, the scanned ends are kind of close to the fortis. There are relatively few phylogenosa, the small finch, and the large finch is, has a big separation. It's different at these sites where the scanned ends is more distinct, there are more of the phylogenosa and they're more distinct, but the magna rosters, the large ground finch, is actually closer. And there are also differences in the mean size of traits. So we have this data for the last 12 years from all three of this, these locations. And we wanted to ask how, how temporally variable is, are these traits in relation to these spatial differences. Now I'm just showing this because we had a bunch of remote sensing data as well as um, some rainfall data for some of the sites which show this huge temporal variation in vegetation through time. The green line is LIDAR uh, data detecting basically um, the amount of vegetation that's present. And so you can see that there's this wet and dry seasons, but there's also differences among sites where Daphne has much less rainfall. Also, sometimes you see huge spikes in one of these distributions, but it's a much smaller spike in the other distribution. So there's temporal variation, there's spatial variation, and there's this interaction between space and time. And all of these things are supposedly driving the evolution of Darwin's finch beaks. So how big is the spatial variation in relation to the temporal variation? So here I'm just going to show you data for beak size for each of the three sites. And what you can see is that all you, though you do see some temporal variation that's occurring at each of these sites, the spatial differences are way bigger, right? So Daphne major, uh, this is uh, Fortis, Daphne major birds are smaller than the Santa Cruz birds, always. And this is true of all of the traits we looked at of all of the species. So how temporally variable is selection itself? Well, somewhat. There's plenty of examples where it is temporally variable, but perhaps it really doesn't matter much for adaptation. Because when you compare it to spatial variation, the spatial differences seem to be much greater than the temporal variation. So I don't want to say that temporal variation isn't important. I just want to emphasize the fact that perhaps it's much less important than spatial variation. And I think that um, some more recent analyses that Stephanie and collaborators have done suggest much the same. The spatial variation tends to be much greater than the temporal variation. OK, next question. Uh, is selection stronger on body size? Now, I think a lot of this debate stems from Edwin <coughs> Drinker Cope who argued or argued that basically within, um, within various lineages, you saw an increase in body size through time. So this became known as Cope's rule, that evolution trends toward larger body size through time. Now, I'm not a macroevolutionary person, but I became interested in this when folks tried to look at um, selection data to provide a microevolutionary explanation for Cope's macroevolutionary pattern. That is, can individual level selection be the basis for Cope's rule? And so uh, Joel Kingsolver, who spoke earlier in IB, and David Fennig, they took the Kingsolver database of all these selection coefficients and they divided them by body size and by everything else. And you see something like this, where here's the linear selection gradient, so the strength of selection, and this is the frequency of observations from this huge meta-analysis. And you see that the body size values are shifted toward positive selection. So from this, they argue that generally populations, most traits in most populations are, uh, sorry, body size in most populations is under positive selection, more so than everything else, which therefore would explain Cope's rule. Now this was in interesting contrast to work that I'd done with Stephanie when she was a master's student at the University of Massachusetts where we started looking at um, selection acting on brown trout uh, 
and other trout in this small stream. And using the same sort of analyses, we looked at how the size of the fish was related to their probability of survival. And over a bunch of different um, age classes and a bunch of different seasons, you can plot these relationships now using cubic splines, so we're not assuming a linear function anymore. But what you see that is in general, they're all kind of declining. So there's no evidence in this study that there's selection for larger body size. So perhaps we can sort of pass that off as a one-off and not be that excited about it. Moreover, these critters are very small. So maybe we should look for selection for large body size in critters that are big. And if you're going to go big, why not go with sharks, right? <laughs> so I had a student who worked on lemon sharks on the island of Bimini in the Bahamas. And so they, this is a big nursery lagoon for lemon sharks. They breed in here and then the juveniles rear in here for a number of years. And we went there and we, well, it, this was his work. He went there and marked a whole bunch of the fish and looked at how that related to their survival through time. So here are some relationships now. There'll be a bunch of different, there are two age classes, but I think I'm only showing one here. Some relationship between probability of survival and the size of the fish, either the length of the fish or the mass of the fish over multiple years, over uh, multiple age classes. Now, you can probably guess what, what it's going to show, right? Big is bad, right? That's a, when bigger is not better. In every case, the larger you were, the lower your probability of survival. The faster you were growing, the lower your probability of survival. And it makes good ecological sense because what happens is that the ones that are growing bigger have to be much riskier in their foraging. So they'll leave the mangroves and go out and start trying to forage where they get eaten by other sharks. So it was the ones that weren't trying to grow big that were living longer. So back to this then. So we thought, well, you know, we've got these couple of examples where we just did not find selection for larger body size. But perhaps we can go back and revisit this debate using another approach because the empirical data will be the same if we plotted selection coefficients, they'd look roughly like that over all of the literature. Let's take another, and once again, orthogonal <laughs> approach to this, and look instead at trait change through time. Because really, if microevolutionary processes are going to be explaining Cope's rule, then we would expect body size to be <coughs> increasing in contemporary populations. That would be the most direct indication of a link between those time scales, right? So, if selection is favoring larger body size, but larger body sizes aren't getting uh, body sizes aren't getting larger in nature, then we wouldn't expect microevolutionary processes to explain Cope's rule. So basically, we want to know what does this distribution look like when we ask about evolutionary change in body size and other traits in relation to um, all of this data that we can find. So we have these really large databases. So now. We have a measure of evolutionary rate, in this case it's called the Darwin, it doesn't matter the specifics of it, and the frequency, and here's zero. So if you're over here, if you're over on this side, you know, Cope's happy, larger body size is being favored. If you're over here, Cope's sad because uh, larger body size is, is not being favored. This is where our data so far were, this is where the meta-analysis seems to suggest. But now we're going to look at trends in actual mean body size rather than estimates of selection, which I've already explained, don't give you a good indication of this fitness function that it has been acting on populations. Okay, so what does this distribution look like? Well, Cope's actually mad in this case because <laughs> in general, body sizes are getting smaller. This is a very large number of studies. Body sizes are decreasing. The largest body size decreases occur when you have fisheries. So Stephanie's got a bunch of Norwegian fisheries buddies over there who, who have some data points in here. So in general, body sizes are actually not increasing in natural populations. So is selection stronger on body size? No. That's a pretty straightforward answer. But I would think that that's what we should expect anyway. Because really, most traits will be reasonably well adapted. The argument for body size being under positive selection has always been that, well, bigger is better for a number of eggs. But there's costs to getting big. 
So body size estimate, body size selection is going to be trading off with something else. And we would generally expect that you wouldn't have consistent directional selection on any trait, including body size. Okay, so I've been kind of talking about a relatively static world, I suppose. But the next question is, how do these things change if, if you change the environment, you perturb the environment somehow? So this is what I've been saying so far, right? You have some fitness function like this, and you have some distribution of phenotypes, and since they're close to the flat part of the fitness function, you have a, a fitness function that's relatively weak across that distribution. The fitness difference between here and here is not that much. But if you take that fitness function, you perturb it through climate change or through fishing or through anything like that, then presumably the, the optimal phenotype is over here now. And now you have a gradient of fitness that's acting across your population. So if you measure selection on that population, you might expect strong selection now. Now there's a number of reasons why we might expect that this would be the case. In particular, if you look at patterns of phenotypic change within populations, you see that perturbed environments do seem to show stronger evolutionary responses. So for example, this is a meta-analysis that we did a number of years ago now, where each data point corresponds to a particular system, and whether or not that system was human disturbed or more, quote, natural. That is, there's no clear human disturbance in the system. And this is the amount of evolutionary change that's taking place in the phenotype. Okay, So each one of these corresponds to uh, a certain evolutionary rate over a certain time frame and the only point that I want to draw here is that the red points which are human disturbed situations tend to have the high values for rates of phenotypic change. <coughs> Many subsequent studies have shown the same thing and we have a much larger database that also says the same thing. When you have anthropogenically disturbed systems the rates of phenotypic change are higher for example, if you fish on a, a population, commercial fishing, the, then they change really quickly in body size and shape. If you have changing um, spring phenology, you often see the shifts in a whole bunch of flowering times and bird arrival times, some of which is genetic, some of which is plastic. And the data points over here are separating out systems for which the genetic basis for this has been confirmed, showing that once again in human disturbed situations, you have rate, higher rates of change. So now I'm going the opposite direction, right? I'm starting with the phenotyp, the, the trait change. Now I'm going to go to the selection part. Because um, when I was in UMass, we also looked in the same stream at juvenile Atlantic salmon. Now, juvenile Atlantic salmon were extirpated or largely extirpated from the Connecticut River quite some time ago. And they now take fish from a variety of locations and introduce them back into these systems. So you're taking Atlantic salmon from a variety of environments throughout New England and putting them into this one small stream in which they have not evolved. So our thought was, well, in that case, they're presumably not adapted for that site, so if we measure selection on them, we should see it. They're presumably being selected for something, maybe body size. So body size in relation to um, absolute fitness, and really we don't see strong <coughs> selection. Maybe in one year, there's selection against large size. But really there's just not much going on. So this was a bit of a surprise because we thought that this perturbed situation we would expect to see strong selection taking place. Now we can also return back to the sharks because we had data for many years from this site. And here's the, the nursery site, here's the mangroves where the, where the sharks hide if they want to avoid predation and then come out at night to forage. But there was a huge environmental perturbation at this site in the middle of our study period. In particular, okay, sorry, so here's the data I showed before, simply showing that for juveniles you see selection against large size. So here are the data points from before. So that's what I've already showed you. Now the environmental disturbance was this. They took this peninsula here and just eliminated all the mangroves because they wanted to have a nice resort there. Now, you would expect that in this situation, this argument that we had before, that the sharks were presumably before hiding out here, well now they can't hide out here. So this would presumably change the selection on body size. So now we have subsequent years where selection was measured again, and indeed it did change selection. 
Okay, so here's what it was before, and here's what it is now. So on the juvenile fish, you now remove the selection against large size. Because now everybody is out there getting eaten by <coughs> other sharks, and the bigger ones aren't the ones that are differentially susceptible to this predation. So the point here is that if you have a major environmental perturbation, you can change selection dramatically. Although in this case it didn't increase, it decreased. Presumably there's other factors that are also correlated with selection on body size. So we've also looked at this in meta-analysis, specifically selecting studies where you had the same organism in two populations, one of which was undergoing a disturbance and one of which was not. So for instance, another population of lemon sharks where there was not any disturbance to the habitat compared to this population. And there are quite a few studies that have this now. So we can compare what's the strength of selection in the, quote, natural situation versus the same species in another population in a disturbed situation. <coughs> Are these things trending up where selection is increasing? Perhaps. Here's what the data look like, and you can see that there's a lot of instances where there's really no selection in either case, right? And there's no change. There are a few instances where selection tends to go down. So basically you're seeing a reduction in selection, and there's a couple where selection goes up. So selection is stronger in the disturbed situation, and those are harvested systems, with the uh, examples occurring here. <coughs> so, does environmental change increase selection? Uh, sometimes. But I say in this case with some surprises, like sometimes it decreases selection, and other times it seems to have no effect. So it's just not a general phenomenon that an environmental change will have a measurably dramatic effect on selection. Okay, so the final situation we might expect where we'll finally see really strong selection is if we have gene flow. So the idea here is you have two different populations adapted to two different environments. You know, this population here is doing pretty well. Uh, it's adapted to that peak, and so it has weak selection on it. But then it gets gene flow from this population, which drags the distribution of phenotypes away from its local optimum. Now this, this population is on the sloped part of this fitness function, and therefore we would expect strong selection. Now this has been shown in many theoretical models, and in addition it has been demonstrated in a couple of natural systems. But I think it is just so frequently assumed that it's <coughs> very rarely tested. As a matter of fact, I only know of two really good studies measuring whether or not selection itself increases when you have higher gene flow. Three. So I just want to provide one example of how we found that this might be occurring. So let's go back to Darwin's finches again. Now here's the distribution of beak sizes at one location, uh, the EG population, Garapetero. And you see this is the small ground finch here, it's beak size on that axis. Here's the medium ground finch, and here's the, small, uh, the large ground finch over there. So these are the different species. In addition, however, you see that this species has this really broad distribution, which for the sake of argument, we can divide into a small beaked version of the medium species and a large beaked version of the medium species. And the differences between these are quite large, actually. So this, these two birds, these two males, caught in the same net, the same time, so they're fully sympatric, and they're in the same species, but there's a big difference in beak size. So we've done a whole bunch of work showing that they tend to mate assortatively, but they make some mistakes. So sometimes they mate together and produce intermediate forms. But our I thought was that these intermediate forms will presumably experience disruptive selection. So they would be disfavored because these guys are eating smaller seeds and doing well, these guys are eating larger seeds and doing well. These guys in the middle, when you produce a hybrid, hybrid, um, they're the same species, uh, might be doing worse. So we measured this, and indeed the probability of survival of these individuals that are being produced by these cross-type matings is lower. So we've been able to detect this dip in selection because you're having gene flow between these two forms that are adapted to different environments. And we have much more data now, which shows that the difference between the individuals before selection and the individuals after selection does indeed again suggest 
that you're seeing selection against the intermediate forms that are being produced when the large and the small beaked forms are mating together and producing an intermediate beaked kid. So in this case, I'd say that gene flow does seem to be enhancing selection, and I think that that would be generally the case in any, well, in many hybrid systems. Two species adapted to different environments. When they start to interbreed, they produce hybrids that aren't adapted to either parental environment and therefore do poorly. So I think there is actually a lot of evidence for that. Okay. Uh, also, we're looking at the genomic level, seeing whether or not you see that evidence of selection against those intermediate genotypes within the same population, and that's being done with a bunch of collaborators at a bunch of locations. <laughs> now, the final thing I want to tell you about, and feel free to take off, um, I, I understand some folks have to go. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about is a very new study we've done on stickleback, where we also asked about the role of gene flow in potentially enhancing selection. So the system is this, where you have a lake population of stickleback, and you have an inlet population flowing into the lake, and a outlet population here. The outlet fish are almost perfectly intermediate between the lake and the inlet fish, which is shown here by looking at a couple of different traits. So the outlet fish are intermediate. Now we've done a whole bunch of work showing that there's very high gene flow from the lake into the outlet, but very low gene flow from the lake into the inlet. So we have this situation here that I posed for you before, but now these two correspond to the different stream populations. Inlet population is not experiencing gene flow, is presumably well adapted. Outlet population is experiencing gene flow, is presumably poorly adapted. So basically there's the inlet and the outlet. So we want to contrast these two populations. We're expecting that if we go in here, we can finally measure strong selection in nature, acting on phenotypes that we know are divergent between these different populations. So it was a huge marker capture study over multiple years, uh, multiple locations, with very large sample sizes. So really we have a very good power and decent recapture rates, so we have a good power to estimate selection. So each of these data points corresponds to a particular time period or year with the selection acting on the inlet population, on body size, body shape, which is the thing that really differs between them. Uh, Selection acting on the inlet population, and in the same time period, in the same year, selection acting on the outlet population. And here's all the data points we have. And the key point here is that they're all below the one-to-one -one line, which means that selection is stronger in the inlet. <laughs> the one that's supposedly well adapted and experiencing no gene flow. So it's completely counter to everything we expected, which was pretty annoying. <laughs> at first, but then we got excited about it because here we have an exception to the proof, to the supposed rule, right? Gene flow is supposed to increase selection, and although it hasn't been tested that much in this kind of context, now this is like the this is actually the third test of it like this, and it's not occurring. Also, the same is true at the genomic level. I'm just going to show very quickly where these are genetic differences across the stickleback genome. Uh, between those that are living and dying during that, those time frames in the outlet, in the supposedly maladapted population. And so what you see is that there's not big genetic differences between the livers and the dyers. Moreover, if you look in two time periods, or sorry, two different summer periods in two different years, and you look at the outliers, the, the uh, genetic markers that are showing the biggest values between, biggest differences between those that live and die in one, one year, are not the same as those that are showing the biggest values between those that live and die in the second year. So there's, we can't find any genetic marker that is seemingly under strong and consistent selection in this population that is supposedly maladapted. The flip side is that we figured out that theoretically, actually, there are a number of situations under which gene flow can actually decrease selection. <coughs> Because what happens is that it basically makes everybody maladapted, in which case you don't have a strong fitness gradient between the, local, the, the residents and the immigrants. Because basically everybody sucks. <laughs> and so you can see that as migration increases, you can actually see a decrease in the strength of selection. Okay, so does gene flow increase selection? Sometimes. But the standard expectations are probably too simple. Because there's a set of conditions under which gene flow will not actually increase selection. 
Okay, so those are the five questions I posed. How strong is selection? Uh, it's usually weak, at least to the point that we can't really measure strong values. How temporally variable is it? Somewhat, but perhaps it's really not that important, at least on relatively modest time scales, in the sense that spatial variation reflecting adaptive divergence really doesn't seem to be dramatically modified by temporal variation within each of those environments. Is selection stronger on body size than other traits? No. There's, there's just no, no qualification I can provide there. The answer is just no. Is environmental change, does environmental change increase selection? Well, sometimes, but there's some curious patterns. Sometimes it decreases selection, and sometimes it has no effect. And finally, does gene flow increase selection? Well, sometimes. But we have some new situations under which there might be a dividing point at which sometimes gene flow is so high that actually it decreases selection. So the hope then is that by compiling a bunch of these different empirical systems where we have very specific studies, along with meta-analyses of many other studies and a little bit of theoretical work, we can try to get new insights into natural selection and hopefully these will help modify what we generally assume to be the nature of natural selection uh, and perhaps motivate future work that doesn't start with those assumptions but rather sets out to test them. Thank you. The bigger they are, the slower they change. It, does that interfere with the way you're looking at this or not? You see what I'm saying? There's a, there's a ontogenetic change yeah. that yeah. interferes, I would think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not. Well, I'm not sure. What I would say interfere, but we are ignoring it because basically what we're simply asking is if you have a, a distribution at one point in time, how will that distribution of body sizes relate to survival into the future? So the larger ones are presumably changing slower during that time period, which I suppose theoretically might be why they're selected against. But it doesn't. I, I can't see a logic for why that would be the case. So yeah, but we also measured it on growth and size standardized growth, as well as catch-up growth and basically in all cases, so growth rate, any size measure we want in our empirical work, it's all selected against based on viability. Yeah. Um, three of your five questions involve increasing levels of selection that might be experienced by populations. What if you change those questions to change the intensity of selection versus increase? Because it could be that you see change in the intensity of selection as a common outcome, but not increases. Um, I think that that could be the case, although I'm in my brain I'm tending to conflate increasing with intensity. So. Because like if the selection gets stronger, then but suppose intensity selection gets weaker. Weaker oh, plus I see. stronger. Okay. Oh, okay, 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 yeah, yeah. Change in intensity. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So, uh, in a number of the systems, yeah, we, we basically tend to ask. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, if we just made everything absolute values, yeah, would we see an in, increase? Changes. Yeah. Um. Well, it's certainly in the shark example, the selection decreased. Because the then you absolute have positive value. results as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then if you look at the, the meta-analysis, which is obviously the one that is the most directly related to a general point here, right there. So those are actually all absolute values again. But as you can see, most of them, there's really no shift. Yeah. So. In each case, yeah, yeah, so, well, in this case, we're, we're looking at the absolute value, so the intensity overall, not just the increasing. And there doesn't seem to be any trend toward, it in, toward increasing in disturbed situations. So I guess the, a follow-up question would be then that in most populations, selection equals zero. Yeah, well, I think for, to a first approximation, current selection equals zero. But the, the, the key point is that the current selection doesn't reflect the selection that got you there in the first place, right? And so I, I, I'm continually annoyed when people go out in nature and they have two different environments that differ, and, they have, and the 
Populations differ in some traits. They measure selection in each, and they expect selection to be pushing in the direction of the divergence between the populations. But unless there's something constraining them, that doesn't make any sense, because they should each be adapted to their respective fitness peaks, at least to some extent, and you shouldn't see divergent selection on them anymore. So I think, to a first approximation, yes, I would say selection is currently zero. But in perturbed environments, I, that's probably not true, uh, even though in a number of instances we can't find it. This could simply reflect the fact that selection estimates, for the reasons I talked about earlier, really aren't always that reliable. You're using always the fitness surrogate, so you don't know what total selection is. So there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, there was another question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I guess my question is sort of similar to Bell's, in that if you have things with moderately indeterminate growth, like the shark example, it seems to me like those sharks, you're just measuring sort of how quickly they're growing, and they would have to pass through the larger life stage to go out of the mangrove anyway. Yeah. So are you really measuring selection? Yeah, yeah, so um, we did also measure selection on growth itself, like on, on the size standardized change of size <coughs> through, that, through the, the up to that time period. Uh, and it's the same pattern. Um, but what this is doing is this is taking a given time period, right? So size is consistent with growth up to that point. So they're all the same age. Yeah, I guess my, my point is if you have to reach a certain size to capture the benefits of being large and having more eggs is doing this on juveniles, they never would have had an opportunity to reproduce to get a higher fitness due to a larger body size yet anyway. Right? Yeah, so I do expect that if you achieve a large body size, there are benefits to it, yes. So, I, because I think on average, basically, the, the total selection on body size is about zero. So yes, if if they get big, then they'll have that they'll have a benefit of being big, but getting there is costly. But I guess if they have to, it seems like you're in an adaptive peak when you're small, and then you go through this higher risk. You have to go and forage in a riskier environment, and then you capture the like you're no longer at risk of predation. Wouldn't you have to go through that trough anyway to reach reproductive but size? But some of the individuals are trying to go through that trough more quickly. They're trying to get to a large reproductive size more quickly. So I guess my argument is if you if you're going through that trough if you are your data seems to suggest selection on a slower rate of size increase, right? But if you rapidly go th through that trough, then your total time in the trough is less. Yeah, that's that's possible. Yeah. Um, we don't have data directly to address that question, but yeah that's possible. But that selection is very strong, right? I mean, it, all those things were, were really strong functions. But yeah, possibly. I guess it just seems like it would be interesting to do it in things with determinate and indeterminate. Uh, we could certainly do that with this kind of thing, yeah. I, I think the selection databases and the evolutionary rate databases, we tend to, we record whether it's determinate or indeterminate growth. Um, I want to come to the defense of Mr. Cope. Uh, <laughs> now, he was, in, he was uh, an anti-selectionist, actually, so he'd be appalled to see selectionists fiddling with his ideas. But uh, apart from that, I think he'd say there's, you're not looking at a long enough time span. And I realize you didn't start the argument with this King Solver and Finney. Uh, but, you know, there's just not long enough yeah. time span. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, even with that, it's tricky. You'd have to you'd want to do a phylogenetic analysis of the data yeah. too, and you'd have to be thinking about clades rather than populations. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if everybody heard that, but basically the argument is that if we're trying to address Cope's rule, we really are looking at it in the wrong scale. And although we didn't start it, and the truth is, it's nonsense. Yeah. I think it's complete nonsense. The only reason we wrote that paper was basically to criticize right. the first paper. Right. It's yeah, just ridiculous to, yeah. to, to look at a picture the, of King Solvers. But I, I don't, I don't <laughs> think there's... Yeah. Cool. So we, we basically do an argument in, the, in that paper as well where we say that we, we don't think that this is in any way trying to actually address yeah. Cope's rule. It's more just saying that the explanation they have doesn't hold up, but the whole thing is nonsense anyway. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I love Joel and David, but I hated that paper. Yeah. It took 10 years to, to let the hate build up to the point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, just a, a very specific question followed by a more general question. 
and that is, in in a changing world, and in, with a when you have um, I don't know directional change in climate or whatever, wouldn't gene flow um, from uh, actually decrease selection if if the climate is catching up to the population that you know you know you get what I'm saying? So the climate's catching up to the, say the more southern population, yeah. and then gene flow of coming from the po southern population is going to make those more homogenous, and so selection would actually decrease with. Yeah, so um, that, that's a, a good point, but I'd like to flip it by saying that actually it would increase selection because what you're doing is you're increasing the phenotypic variance in the population. The individuals that are coming in from the further south would be favored. And so you would actually, you, you would actually increase selection, but you would, and that is what speeds the response, right? Because now you have, yeah, if you have some distribution. Oh, it all depends on the time scale, though. So if you have selection always happening, right? I mean, sorry, gene flow always happened before that change happened, right? And so you had right. these populations that had a really large yeah, okay. and spatial temporal, you know, they, they considered one large mega population. Then, and then you could have a situation where, and, and I guess that gets to my more general point, is that I love every, all, this entire talk with, you know, I love the specific studies, but when you, when you put them all together like this, I, I really see selection as more like every one of these cases is almost like a snowflake. And there are idiosyncratic um, moments at which selection becomes important through time and space. And I wonder, I really wonder about, especially say things like population size and generation time and genetic diversity, right? I mean, if you had uh, populations with no genetic diversity, then you can't expect a lot of selection. They just go extinct or something. So how, how do you factor in all those things when you just put it all together and say, this is going so, to go this so way. So I personally uh, agree. I think that the important selection can often be really episodic, be here or there for this reason or that reason. And it's hard to catch that moment. So um, really what I'm trying to do here is I, I am kind of agreeing with that by basically saying that these generalities that people have stated by mushing everything together really aren't general. Yeah. So I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that one. And um, I don't think there's necessarily a huge amount to be gained by actually taking these big compilations of selection and trying to make inferences like his body size <coughs> under stronger or weaker selection because it's so idiosyncratic. I, yeah, I, I kind of agree. I, I hate agreeing to too, so. <laughs> just, just related to that, because this is what reviewers like to come back with. So they would say, well, if it's idiosyncratic, why study it? <laughs> well, why, yeah. meta, why, why meta analyze it? Well, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, you know? yeah, yeah, why meta analyze it? Why meta analyze it? Yeah, God knows. Because you can? No, but, but <laughs> if it's idiosyncratic, then you need to measure it, right? Yeah. Because yeah. that's yeah. the only way you'll figure out what's going on. But. Yeah. You, you need to measure it over many times, and you know, uh, yeah, so it, it's tricky. It's um, interesting though, because there's definitely a body of people out there that believe if you cannot identify a common pattern, that's not worthy of study. Yeah. And this transcends many fields. Yeah. I, I think that if, if, the other thing is I don't actually have a huge amount of faith in how predictive selection estimates are of subsequent change, just because of all the, all the nuances of making sure you get a good fitness estimate and correlated traits and stuff like that. But I, I would disagree, because I've done this, it, in the fact that I think meta-analyses of trait change are actually uh, quite valuable, because that, that's a real thing. That's traits actually changing through time. And there, many generalizations have emerged. So for example, harvested populations do show the strongest traits of trait change. That's a very consistent pattern. Um, and there have been other approaches where you've been able to draw really generalizations about rate, like rates of change of the traits themselves. So I, I think that some useful things have come from that. But from the selection estimates, sorry Stephanie, but you know, there's just so much, yeah, I, I mean, I know you agree that there's so much idiosyncrasy. Idiosyncrasy. <laughs> There, it, it just seems like the, the devil's in the details. I mean, yeah. I, I guess I agree with some of what Paul's saying. In, in these, so, you know, it, the grants measured temporal changes in selection in the, in the finches during the El Nino years in the 80s, right? And, and, and so if you had done those temporal studies in that particular species <coughs> at that time, you might have come to a, a different conclusion. So, yeah. There was a question in the back from Luke. I just wanted to 
I just had a somewhat specific question about the brown trout case and that that's a pretty popular sport fishing species and was wondering where that was actually done because you could have very easily detected a pattern of something getting smaller when it's being heavily fished, especially the large ones, because you often toss back the smaller ones and then you keep the big trophies. So, yeah, um, that's quite possible. It, it, that would be the case here. We were looking at small juveniles and I don't know, I don't think that population is fished, is it Stephanie? No fishing in that population, but we were also looking at the fish. Okay. So they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have been fished. But generally, uh, that was well, the case. Fishing, basically, you do see selection against large size. Pretty much every time you do it. I hate to cut off questions, but this is going on for a while. So maybe people who have more questions uh, can come up. And let's thank Andrew for a fantastic talk.